Hello, here we go again, another podcast episode. It's, uh, where are we, 7.30 in the morning, 6 degrees C, 42 Fahrenheit, 87% humidity, 995 millibars, blue sky, even though it's early, blue sky, and the flag is barely moving. So quite nice at the moment. Right, let's get straight into it. Email from Tina. Hello, Tina. Was there frozen food when you were young? Right, when did frozen food come in? I think in the early 60s, one or two shops started stocking, I don't know, basic stuff like frozen peas, fish fingers, of course, and they had to be cooked straight away. You couldn't obviously keep them. You didn't have a freezer. A lot of people didn't even have a fridge. So you go and buy your frozen peas, take them home and cook them that day. What people did have, if they didn't have a fridge, they had a a pantry with what they called a cold shelf. That was basically like a tiled shelf in a cupboard. And at the back on the outside wall was a a grill. So you got the fresh air in from outside, which was great in the winter. But you couldn't really, well, you couldn't store frozen food there. But it would keep food cool. As a child, I hated drinking warm milk in the summer. It was dreadful. I remember when we got our first fridge, it was an Electrolux and drinking ice-cool milk from the fridge, it was fantastic. It was just a totally different ball game. And of course, with a fridge in the little ice box that they used to have, you could keep ice cream, for example, lollies, things like that for kids, which was amazing. We'd never had them before. Well, not kept at home anyway. You'd go and buy one from the ice cream man or the, the sweet shop who had fridges and freezers. But to actually have a an ice cream or a lolly at home, was unheard of before you had a fridge. Tina also asks whether we went to the gym back in those days. Well, I didn't as a kid. I don't know that there were gyms around, to be honest. In fact, our local sports centre wasn't there when I was a kid. So I I don't know. The thing is, though, Tina, people didn't need a gym. Take a, a housewife, to use the term from that era. A housewife, she was doing housework, washing, ironing, Very often she did the gardening, she mowed the lawn, she did the weeding. She often, like my mother did, she did the decorating, painting, cleaning. It was never ending. For example, Monday was wash day. You get the single tub washing machine out if you had one, or the twin tub if you were really lucky, if you were really well off, (laughs) and you'd stand there all morning. I remember my mum on a Monday, if I bunked off school, you know, pretending I was ill, which I wasn't, and she believed me, I'd watch her do the washing. She was doing it all morning, then rinsing it and rinsing it again, or putting it through a mangle, and then hang it out on the line. No tumble dryers, nothing like that. No automatic washing machine. So she wouldn't have needed the gym. Then there's the ironing. It just went on and on. It was physical work for any married woman back then. It was hard physical work. And the shopping, of course, was almost a a daily routine because there were no supermarkets. I think supermarkets started coming in in the early 60s. So you would go to the local shops, which was only round the corner, at the most a mile away, which was nothing for people to walk back then. I mean, these days, oh, I'm not walking over there. I'm going to take the car. You know, it's at least 200 yards. I'm going to drive. <laughs> but back then, if you didn't have the fridge, fridges came in. I don't know when fridges actually came in, but most people got their first fridge perhaps late 50s, early 60s. So with no fridge, you would have to buy things almost daily. And that's what people did. They go to the local shop every day. So apart from all the housework and everything else, there was a shopping to do. Also to keep housewives fit in the, well, probably in the early 50s, mid 50s, they didn't have a vacuum cleaner. They had a carpet sweeper. Do you remember those? You've probably seen them in museums. (laughs) We have one at home. I remember helping my mother do the housework with this carpet sweeper. You basically push it backwards and forwards and there's roller brushes underneath that are driven by the wheels. And if you're lucky, it'll pick up dust and bits and pieces. Then you go and empty it in the dustbin. So every job was physical. It was using your muscles to turn the television volume up or down or change to the Second channel, when we had two channels, you had to get out of your chair, walk across the room to the TV. Not just laze on the armchair and press buttons on the remote control. You had to get out of your chair. Imagine doing that these days, truth. 
Goodness me, how things have changed. Anyway, let's move on. It's Easter, isn't it? Apparently, Cadbury's, you know, the chocolate people, they make Easter eggs and goodness knows what. Well, they have been slammed. Slammed, I like that. Because they're calling their Easter eggs now gesture eggs. What is a gesture egg? They're being accused of cancelling Easter. I know I'm always banging on about changing pub names and changing street names. Well, they're now changing Easter egg to, I don't know, je what is a gesture egg? Apparently, they said it so they don't offend certain people. I don't know, offend who's offended? Who on earth would be offended by an Easter egg being called an Easter egg? Anyway, there we are. They'll be changing the summer next. Although we can't call it summertime, we'll have to call it the hot season. <laughs> In case the word summer offends people. What a load of beep <laughs> rubbish. <laughs> Melissa, nice to hear from you. Now, you actually sparked off this particular episode with your Some People Have All The Luck email. Melissa is early 20s. And she says herself, she's not bad looking. She's not ugly. She's not extremely attractive, but she's not ugly. All her friends have no trouble getting boyfriends. Whenever they go out, the boys all head for her friends and ignore her. She says that she is quite sociable. She's a happy type of person. She's not standing in the corner, miserable, so the people ignore her. She's got charisma, apparently. And she's saying, why is it some people have all the luck? There was a record, wasn't there? Some guys have all the luck. Some guys have all the fun. Do you remember that? Rod Stewart did that. I think someone else did it as well. She says it was the Living Alone episode. Do you remember that? That was last Sunday, wasn't it? That gave her the idea of emailing and saying, well, I could end up living alone later in life because no one wants me. I'm sure people will want you. Melissa, don't worry. You're young. Early 20s. Truth. That's young. You've got plenty of time yet. But I do know what you mean. It, some people do seem to have all the luck. I remember a chap I knew many, many years ago. He used to say he was ugly. I wouldn't have used that word, but he used to say to me, I'm ugly, aren't I? You've got to admit. And I'd say, well, I wouldn't call you ugly, but you know, you're not one of the best looking people around, but you're not ugly. And he never had girlfriends. He couldn't get girlfriends. I think what it was with him, he thought he was ugly. So he became a little bit reserved, a little bit of a, a recluse. Now, here's the thing. Some people have all the luck. I have often thought, why is it that male or female, let's take a male, there's an extremely good-looking chap. He really is good-looking, and all the girls are after him. Fantastic-looking chap. Someone else, I won't use the word ugly because it's horrible, but someone else is just not good-looking. They are far from good-looking. Uh, verging on not ugly. <laughs> What's a better word to you? This friend of mine, he just labelled himself as ugly. It's the same with girls, young women, I suppose even more so, because one young woman will be extremely attractive, stunning, as they call it, don't they, these days? Stunning young lady, absolutely fantastic looks. And someone else is, what's that term we used to use? Plain Jane. Not frumpy, but plain Jane. Not ugly by any means, but just hasn't got the the stunning looks that someone else might have. It seems very unfair. I, you know, I used to think that in my teens. I'd be out clubbing somewhere, looking at the girls, as I did back then. I don't now, of course, moving on swiftly. I would often think, look at that girl there. She is a fantastic-looking girl. And then perhaps someone else in the club, I'd look over to her. It was so unfair that one had the looks and the other one just didn't have any looks at all. Of course, you shouldn't judge a book by its cover. Now, there's an old saying. How true is that? You shouldn't judge a book by its cover. I'm fortunate. I've always been extremely good-looking, fantastic charisma, wonderful looks, brilliant personality, and intelligent with it. Right, sorry, I must have dozed off then. I was dreaming. Uh, where was I? Ah, I know where I was. Talking rubbish, as usual. <laughs> Just taking the car in for MOT and service. MOT. Do you have that abroad? Do you have that in America, Australia? What's it stand for? Ministry of Transport. I don't know why they've called it Ministry of Transport. Basically, they check the car over once a year, make sure it's all in order, lights working properly, brakes, etc. And you get a certificate saying your car is roadworthy. I believe there's a clause, though, that if something happens 
the minute you drive it out of the garage, then the MOT certificate doesn't apply. Someone will correct me on that, no doubt. Raise rants at protonmail.com. Also having the car serviced. That means they change the oil and kick the tyres, I think. <laughs> there we are. We've done that, sir. We've changed the oil and kicked the tyres. That's 300 quid. Oh, and the MOT. Well, let's call it a grand, shall we? Round it up to a grand. And, of course, we'll be delighted to see you again next year. I'm sure you will, as delighted as my dentist when I turn up there. Oh, look, it's Ray. Oh, and Tricia. That means I can book my holiday abroad at last. Come in, you two. Come in. How's the bank balance? How's the finances? All right. Jolly good. Take a seat. To be honest, the local garage we use are brilliant. They are absolutely brilliant. There have been various things in the past wrong with the car and they've been totally honest. Because I'm not daft when it comes to cars. I'm not a mechanic, but I'm not daft. I am mechanically minded. And they've never tried to fob me off with stories. Oh, you need this, you need that. You know, they don't come out with these daft stories. And of course, that's why we go back there every year. Year in, year out, we go to them. And if there's a problem in between the MOT and the service, we we'll nip up there and they'll sort it out for us. Really good. I was talking about this the other day, wasn't I? Small family-run businesses. This garage isn't part of a huge chain. It's a family-run local business. Same with the garden centre. Do you remember I told you where I bought the plants? The members of staff there, being a family-run business, they know what they're talking about. You could say, look, I've got a shady spot. There's hardly any sun, but I want a bit of colour there. What plant do you suggest? And they'll give you some ideas even take you across to somewhere and say, look, these plants here, they don't mind the shade, minimum sun, they will thrive nicely. They know what they're talking about. Same at the garage. They are interested. They will phone me and say, look, we found this, we found that, what do you want to do? No point banging on about it, but it is like the old days where you could go locally and they're interested in you, the customer. They want to keep you as a customer. You are a valued customer. Whereas these days, well, yeah, what would you want? <laughs> no, I ain't got that. Right, who's next? In fact, one of the ladies at the garden centre, she saw us when we went back and she said, oh, back again, how can I help this time? She was brilliant. She recognised us as valued customers. I love it. We're only going to go there. You see, it's worked. We are only going to go there in future, nowhere else. We are now regular customers of theirs. And we've got a loyalty card. Goodness knows what that means, but we have a loyalty card. <laughs> I don't know. All these cards, you fill up your purse or your wallet with half a million cards. I don't know what half of them do. Someone said to me, you and your nostalgia. I was banging on about something when I was a boy. You and your nostalgia. I said, what do you mean? And they were saying, oh, well, you're always going on about the past. I looked up the word nostalgia to see exactly what it means. And it says, a bittersweet longing for things, persons or situations of the past. The condition of being homesick, homesickness, especially a severe and sometimes fatal form of mel I can't say this, melancholy, Ilya. <laughs> well, being melancholy, being miserable, due to homesickness. That's weird, isn't it? So it's a bittersweet longing for things, persons of the past. It was a few months ago, someone said to me, oh, you've got this... This utopian, what was it, utopian type picture of the 1950s, the 60s. You want to go back to some sort of utopia? I don't at all. I just want to see a policeman riding by on a bike like he used to. I want to be able to phone the police station if there's a problem and they take an interest. I want to see the roads kept free and clear of litter. I want to see the roads maintained. No potholes. Blah, blah, blah. So it goes on. Is that... Wanting to go back to some utopian... I don't know. People do talk... Is that word again beginning with... Um, yes, B. Oh, rubbish. That's it. We've got the car back. The MOT's done. The service is done. And we had to have a coil spring. A rear offside coil spring. You know, the suspension. I don't know what was wrong with the old one, but they've replaced that. And I was surprised, amazed at the price. I'm thinking four, five, six hundred, eight hundred... 300 quid. That's not bad, is it? 300 pounds. I'm not going to complain at that. Oh, well, we had the new tyre the other day, didn't we? That was 75 quid. So that's all done for another year, which is good. The car is now ready. Well, we need to clean it inside and out. 
And it's ready for our Isle of Wight trip in May. I'm really looking forward to that this year. Catherine, nice to hear from you again in, uh, where are you? Washington State, USA. You talked about me mowing the lawn. Yes, I find it therapeutic. And you agree, you love gardening. I love gardening. I always have. Since I was a child, we had a little plot of uh, garden, each of us kids at home, a little strip of land, which was our garden. And I love doing that, putting plants in and learning about the weeds and stuff. Excellent. Catherine and I in the email were talking about being connected to the earth. Now, I'm not a tree hugger. I don't like these labels, tree hugger and all that stuff. But I do like going to the woods and sitting there on the ground with my back to a pine tree, breathing in the, the atmosphere, listening to the wildlife, listening to the breeze in the trees. It's just lovely. I feel at home. I don't know what it is. As I said to Catherine, it might be some primeval instinct. Thing. I don't know. Millions of years ago, we all lived in the woods, didn't we? We lived in caves and things. and <laughs> Went round with loincloths and spears and long hair and beards. <laughs> Perhaps that's why I like it. Because I was a hippie in the 60s. Perhaps it's... No, it's not my hippie thing coming through. I just wonder whether there is some millions of year old memory that I've got. That's interesting thought, isn't it? But I do love the woods. Given the choice, if someone said, we'll go downtown, we'll have a look around the shops, we'll go out for a meal, perhaps take in a show, or we'll go to the woods. You know which one I choose, don't you? I hate the town. I really do hate it. Hello, Joe from Maryland. More United States of America listeners. I like it. The more, the better. Joe mentioned Jack Hargreaves. Yes, that's right, Joe. I do like Jack Hargreaves, the out-of-town programmes. And you lived in the UK, didn't you, briefly? I forget where it was now. You lived here for two or three years. And that brought back nice memories, talking about Jack Hargreaves. He was calm. I know I've banged on about this before. He was just so calm and relaxed. What's the modern word? Chillax? Is it something daft like that? He didn't shout or get overexcited. He just calmly talked to us, the viewers. Lovely. Great to hear from you, Joe. Thanks for contacting me. I don't believe this. I've just had a Met Office email. Urgent Met Office warnings in place as temperatures plunge ahead of 70 mile an hour winds with parts of Britain already blanketed in snow. Well, it's certainly not down here on the south coast. I did see something on Twitter, is it? Or X or whatever they call it now. I saw some photos on there earlier this morning. Someone had taken a photo of their garden, which was covered in snow. We're almost in April. Mind you, we have had snow in May before now, so what a shame, though. I thought the summer was here. <laughs> I'm impatient. That's the trouble. I'm impatient. Going back to some people having all the luck. Chap I knew, him and his wife, they lived in a, a flat. Nothing special, but uh, they were paying the mortgage on the flat. And her mother passed away and left the house to her, my friend's wife. So they moved into the house, sold the flat, got a load of money. And this other chap I knew, he said, oh, it's all right for them. Uh, being left a house, uh, it's not fair. And I said, well, it's not really all right for them because she has lost her mum. I think she was in her 90s. And he said, oh, I know that, yeah, but uh, it's all right for them. They're lucky getting all that money, being given a house. I thought it was far from lucky. Anyway, there we are. A couple of years later, his mother passed away. He was an only child, so his mother left him the house. <laughs> so they got given another house, which they sold, of course, because they're already living in one house, sold their flat, sold this house, hundreds of thousands in the bank, and they were extremely well off. They bought a, a boat, only a small sort of motorboat thing to whiz up and down the, the seafront on. They bought a, a caravan. They did all sorts. They went on holidays abroad. And this chap I knew again, oh, it's all right for them. Oh, they get all the luck. And I said again, well, now, you know, he's lost his mum now. I, I don't see that any of this is lucky. I think his mother was in her 90s as well, so that wasn't too bad. But uh, And then this chap said to me, he said, oh, my parents had me when they were very young. I've got to wait years before I get any inheritance. And I thought, well, that's nice. You're waiting for your parents to pass away. I don't know. Some people are strange, aren't they? There was someone else recently. Uh, his mum 
went into a nursing home, had a lovely house, went into a nursing home, and you know how the rules apply? You have to sell the house to pay the nursing home fees. I'm not sure the ins and outs of it. This is something that happens a lot. He was waiting for the inheritance. He was waiting for the house. And the whole lot went to the nursing home. They sold the house and it had to go to the nursing home to pay the fees. He ended up with nothing. So he was looking forward to getting this house left to him in the will. And he ended up with nothing at all. He wasn't nasty about it. He had just said on the odd occasion, when my mum goes, I will be left the house because he was an only child. And she'd always said, oh, one day this will all be yours. And of course, none of it was. <laughs> it, it all went to the nursing home. Rob, down under in Australia, nice to hear from you. I think it was you emailed me, wasn't it, Rob, about the clock chimes uh, and the seagulls. And you wanted to hear them at the same time. I'll try, and, I'll try and put those two audio clips together, mix them together for you. I forget why you wanted to hear that. The clock chime, uh, that was Ernie. Was it Ernie suggested that he sent me the clock chimes for the It's That Time Again midweek message, which I've been using. And the seagulls, of course, are on the main Sunday podcast episode. Talking of people being lucky, I knew a, a girl many decades ago. She rented a flat for her and her baby. I don't know what the story is. I don't know where the father was, but I only knew her vaguely just to chat to her if we bumped into each other. Sometimes she'd get a babysitter and then come along to the pub on a Friday evening or a Saturday evening and join in with us lot. And she rented this flat and she was there, it must be 10 years. I knew her over all that period of time, 10 years. And she said that the landlord, this old chap, Never put the rent up. I think he felt sorry for her from what she was saying. He never put the rent up in all the ten years she was there. One evening she came into the pub looking rather sullen, almost in a state of distress. And we're saying to her, you know, what's the matter? What's happened? My landlord's passed away. I don't know what's going to happen to the flat. I'll probably be thrown out. So that was sad. But a couple of, <laughs> a couple of weeks later she came into the pub beaming all over her face. She looked ecstatically happy. And uh, we're all saying, what, you're still renting the flat? You haven't lost your home? I haven't lost my home, she said. He left me the flat in his will. <laughs> How about that? Talk about lucky. It wasn't lucky, though, just luck. She had done a lot for him. She used to pop round, because he was getting on in years. She used to go around to his place. He only lived a mile away or so. And she would do housework for him, things like that. She'd do a bit of shopping for him. And he showed his appreciation by leaving her the flat in his will. I remember one of the lads in the pub moaning under his breath so only we could hear. She couldn't hear. Oh, lucky so-and-so. Oh, all right for her, isn't it? Oh. And I just looked at him. I didn't say anything. I just thought, what a nasty person. But there we are. That's people for you, isn't it? We're all different. Thankfully, I'm not like that. Fortunately, I've never been money orientated. It's just not something I've ever thought about. Obviously, I need money. We needed money to pay the mortgage, which we've now done, and you need money to survive. But I've never craved money or yearned for things. Obviously, it would be nice to get a new car. Our car's getting on in years now, but it's all right. It gets us from A to B, and it's passed the MOT and had its service, so it's okay. It would be nice to have a new kitchen. I fitted our kitchen here, which was quite a few years ago now. It would be nice to pick up the phone and say to some company or other, come and fit us a new kitchen. Doesn't matter what it costs, we'd like a new kitchen. We could do that, but it would eat into our savings and uh, don't like the idea of that. We're going to have the kitchen retiled. I did the tiling many years ago and a friend of ours, he is a heating engineer, plumbing and all that stuff, and he does tiling as well. And funnily enough, the other day he was round and we were talking about the kitchen. And he said, well, I'll retile it for you. So if he can do that, I can sort out the cupboard doors and things like that. Paint the ceiling and whatever else needs doing. And it'll tidy it up quite nicely. The new bungalow my parents and I moved into in the 50s. I was five years old. The kitchen cupboards were painted. So all you had to do was just repaint them if they got a bit scruffy. Whereas, of course, these days everything's... Well, it was chipboard. It's now MDF, is it called? 
Yes, it's MDF, isn't it? And our kitchen doors, the cupboard doors, are covered in some kind of plastic, which is peeling off. And I ripped it off a couple of the doors and painted the doors white. You can see they've been painted, but it doesn't look too bad, actually. It's only if you go up close and have a look. You know, oh, look, it's been painted. But we don't care. As long as it's clean and looks tidy, we don't care about that. We don't want tens of thousands of pounds worth of new kitchen fitted <laughs> with gold taps and goodness knows what else. <laughs> We're not into all that. We're not materialistic at all. This is our home. It's not a show house. I think we live sometimes as if we were back in the 50s or 60s. We have two sofas in the lounge. Both were second hand. We didn't buy new ones. We have a new one in the dining room. That's getting old now. That needs replacing. But the lounge sofas, they're both second hand. We've had them for years. They're getting a little bit uh, tatty here and there. <laughs> and there's some holes been torn. I think they're leather. There's some holes been torn in the arms. But the thing is, when the grandchildren, not so much now, they're growing up, but when the grandchildren came round, they'd, you know, they'd sit on the sofa, they'd put their feet on the sofa, they'd even jump on it. We would say, no, don't jump on the furniture. Of course they would. Whereas if we'd had thousands of pounds worth of brand new furniture, don't touch that, don't sit there, don't touch that. Look, get out of this room, go in there, go in there and play. I would hate all that. That's not a proper home. Obviously, we didn't let the grandchildren wreck the place. And they wouldn't have wrecked the place. They were brought up properly. But if they did happen to leap onto the sofa with their shoes on, it didn't matter. It wasn't the end of the world. The reason I mentioned we lived like the 50s and 60s is because back then, people didn't buy new furniture, or very few people. People didn't have money then. They couldn't go out and buy a new three-piece suite. We have just bought a new bed. That's different, a new bed and mattress. That's slightly different. Don't really want a second-hand mattress. You don't know where it's been or who's done what on it. <laughs> but back in the 50s and 60s, people bought second-hand furniture. We've had some lovely pieces of furniture from the second-hand shop. Round the, well, it's gone now. There was one round the corner from us. We bought all sorts of things from there. Lovely coffee table. And we bought many, many years ago a three-piece suite. That was really nice. That did us for quite a few years. There's no need to go into town or go online and spend hundreds of thousands of pounds on new furniture. Also, back in the 50s and 60s, people bought second-hand clothes. There were second-hand clothes shops around. There were jumble sales that used to be held at schools, the village hall, the church hall or whatever. And these days, I've bought things from eBay. I go to local, what we call car boot sales here in, in Britain. And I've bought several jackets and various other items. Trish has bought dresses and things like that. Perfectly all right. And some of them have even got tags on. They're new and not been worn. Some have even got tags on. I bought a lovely jacket oh, many years ago. I think I paid five pounds for it. And that had a new tag on it. Goodness knows what it would have cost if it had been new in the shop. And we also wander around charity shops. When we go to Butlins at Bogner, which I hate, as you know, there are, <laughs> there are a lot of charity shops in Bogner. And just for a bit of escapism, we escape from Butlins. You, know, you can climb over the barbed wire fence. You have to look out for the security, the uh, the red coats, as they used to be called. Do you remember the red coats? But you can escape and go into Bogner Town. Of course, it's not long before you're rounded up and dragged back into the camp. But seriously, I have bought several things from the charity shops in Bogner. I remember at my school in the 50s, we'd have jumble sales there in the main hall. And my mum would go there. I'd go with her. Perhaps on a Saturday, they'd have a jumble sale. It would be well advertised locally. And it would be packed. People from all over the place would come to the school, rummage through clothes. And it was mainly, I remember this, it was mainly, I suppose they were old because I was young, old women. I remember these old women almost fighting each other, rummaging through coats on these big tables and various clothes, almost having a punch up grabbing things. <laughs> it was quite funny to watch. They probably weren't old. I suppose it's because I was, what, eight, nine years old that even if they were 20, they looked very old to me. But I thought they were all old women. Jumble sales were very popular back then. And of course, now we've got the car boot sales where you can buy, well, anything, clothes, all sorts of things. What we didn't have in the 50s and 60s 
which I think in many ways was a good thing, we didn't have credit cards. If you didn't have the cash, then you couldn't buy whatever it was you wanted. So people didn't get into debt. Well, very rarely there was what they call the never-never HP higher purchase. You could go into a shop and buy a washing machine on, on HP and you pay so much weekly. You may have had to put down a couple of pounds as a deposit. They would deliver it and then you have to pay so much a week until it's paid for. And of course, if you didn't pay, they took the washing machine away. You could buy cars on HP as well. And even some local shops would do what they call tick. Just waiting for my husband's wage packet. He gets paid Friday. I know it's only Wednesday. Can I have a loaf of bread and pint of milk or whatever on tick until Friday? And very often the shopkeeper, if you were a good customer, they'd say, yep, OK, that's uh, two and sixpence halfpenny. See you on Friday. And he'd write it down. And if people didn't pay, I've seen this on the shop window with that white paint type chalk they used to use to write on glass. It would say, Mrs. Smith, 10 High Street, owes two and sixpence. <laughs> and she'd be publicly shamed, I suppose, is what they call it these days, isn't it? The shopkeeper would write it on the window. And of course, everyone would know, oh, Oh, so-and-so hasn't paid. Look, look, she owes him half a crown. Struth, stone the crows. So they'd have to pay it. If they didn't, they'd get the money together somehow to get that wiped off the window. Just thinking of owing money back then, bankruptcy was serious. It was very, very frowned upon. It, it was a stigma, real stigma. If you went bankrupt, oh, naughty, naughty. These days, people run up a load of debts. Oh, I can't pay all that. I'll go bankrupt. They don't owe a penny. It's all wiped out. They don't owe anything. Of course, you can't do that if you've got a house and you own a car or whatever. They'll take things away. But a friend of mine went bankrupt. Oh, I'm going back 25 years. He lived in a rented flat. He had a company car for the job he did. So they couldn't take his car away. They couldn't take the flat away. It was rented. I don't know what he owed. It was a few thousand. And that was it. Right. It's all wiped off. That's it, your debt's all cleared, it's all wiped off. He didn't owe anyone a penny. And there was no stigma. I remember him going in the pub saying, that's it, I don't owe anyone anything, I'm clear. I must have been a few of us were saying, well, had he done that sort of back in the old days, he wouldn't have shown his face in here, he would have been too embarrassed. But these days, no one cares. The problem is, if someone goes bankrupt owing small businesses, say you've got a small firm and you go bankrupt and you owe local businesses and you don't pay them, or you can't pay them because you're bankrupt, then it affects them, it can bankrupt them. That's the trouble, it has this knock-on effect. And also in the old days, I don't know about now, if you bounce the cheque, you haven't got the money, the cheque won't be honoured, it's going to bounce. In the old days, you could go to prison for that, and people did. I don't know what happens now, people don't write cheques, do they? I'm sure if you wrote a cheque today and it bounced, you wouldn't end up in prison. If people end up in trouble with credit cards, it seems that it can all be written off and that's the end of the problem. Very much different in the old days. You know, you bounced checks, you, you didn't have a credit card, you had cash. And if you didn't have cash, you couldn't buy anything. It was simple as that. I'm reminded of that old saying from the war years, make do and mend. If your socks had a hole in, then you darn the socks, you darn the hole. You make do with stuff, you mend stuff, you didn't chuck it out and buy new things. The trouble is these days, our washing machine, we've had it 10 years, the main drum bearings have gone, one or two other problems. To have it repaired would cost as much as a new machine anyway. I would repair it myself. I've done the drum bearings before on washing machines, but my knee hurts, my back hurts. <laughs> you know all about that. I can't get down on the floor and do that. So we're going to buy a new washing machine. Our kettle thing, we've got this sort of boiler thing that keeps the water hot and you just put your cup under it and fill it up when you need boiling water. We've just had to buy a new one. Can't get a seal for it. Oh no, we don't do parts. You want a part? What do you mean you want a part? You just buy a new one. It only wanted a new seal. Oh, and the latch thing on the lid broke. I could replace that if I could get the parts. But you can't these days. I think that's terrible, actually. Very few things can be repaired. Catherine, just going back to your email, you asked where Tricia and I met many, many moons ago. Where did we meet? 
You're going to love this. It was in a bar. Where else? <laughs> in a bar. I don't know. We'd known each other for a while and we got chatting and, well, the rest is history, as they say. In the old days, when I was a boy, I met many a girl in the local bars, <laughs> the pubs. Dreadful, isn't it, when I look back, things I did. Do you look back to your youth and wonder how on earth you got away with some of the things and wonder just how bad you, you were? Or perhaps you were good. Perhaps it was only me that was bad. But that's it, Catherine. I forgot to answer that when I answered your email, so I sent you another email. We met in a bar. Talking of Trisha, several of you, quite a few of you, have said, when's Trisha going to join in on a podcast episode again? She will, when she's got something to say. <laughs> she will. We'll, we'll sort something out. And I'm still working on this guest that I told you about. I'm getting closer. I am now set up here ready for the guest. And that should be hopefully very soon. Just briefly going back to the old days when you didn't have credit cards. If you wanted something, you had to save up for it. I think, or I know, that that made people appreciate whatever it was even more. You save up week after week, putting a few shillings away. Eventually you buy the item and you appreciated it far more. These days it's so different. You want an armchair. Oh, we need an armchair to go in the corner of the dining room. Yeah, we're going to buy one. After a while, it gets damaged in some way, ripped or scratched or whatever happens to it. It's not a big deal anymore. Oh, look at that. We have to buy a new one or get it done on the insurance or something. Whereas back then, I don't know, it was just so much better in so many ways. Here we go. Back to the good old days when I was a boy. When I was a boy, well, a lad of 18, I was living at home with my parents and this girl I knew, only a friend, her parents split up. They got divorced. They sold the house, took half the money, the equity, half the equity each, moved into a flat and left the girl, basically their daughter, left her homeless. Her father said, well, I've got no room here. And her mother said, well, I've got no room. I've now got this pokey little flat. I've got no room for you. It was a dreadful situation. She slept on people's sofas. I couldn't offer her a sofa because I was at home with my parents. I believe she stayed with her dad for a couple of days on his sofa and then her mum's place. Basically, she was homeless. Now, her grandmother, that was her dad's mother, heard of this and said, right, you're going to come and live with me, which is what happened. The grandmother wasn't at all pleased that the parents had split up. Anyway, she took the girl in and she lived there with her grandmother for several years, it must have been, until the grandmother passed away. You know what I'm going to say? I bet you've guessed already. The grandmother left the house to the girl, to her granddaughter. She would have left it to her son and his wife. But no, she was not at home to Mr Happy when she discovered that her granddaughter had been thrown out of the house, left homeless. Obviously the girl was upset that she'd lost her grandmother, but at least she had a house. A lovely house. I saw it once. I didn't go in. I saw it from the outside. It was a lovely house. And apparently, she was telling me one day, apparently her parents... <laughs> had started arguing, that should be mine, that should be ours, you should sell it, we should have half each, and all this business. I think in later years it had all calmed down and they were all, well, I won't say friendly again, but uh, they weren't at, at war with each other. A lot of feuds and arguments, disagreements, it's all over money, isn't it? That's all a lot of people think about, money, money grabbing, how much can I get, what's in it for me, how much can I get out of it? It's a shame people have to be like that. One of the happiest people I knew uh, was in his 20s. I was in my 20s. He had, you know, I've been on about bed sits recently, a bed sitting room. He lived in a bed sitting room and he'd lived in it for something like five years. I think he was mid-20s. And he was perfectly happy. It was rented, of course. He paid his rent every week. There was a slot meter for the electricity. And he was more than happy. He wanted for nothing. The rent was extremely reasonable because it was only one room, basically. There was a little bathroom off the, the main room, but he didn't have any problems. He had no maintenance to do, just paid his rent, and he was free. Free as a bird, he used to say. I remember that. I'm free as a bird. I lost touch with him in the end, but I know he was there for a good few years, and he was a very happy person. When I lived in the village decades ago, there was a chap who lived in the village, and we called him Scrooge. He was known as... Scrooge. 
as in Ebenezer. <laughs> Charles Dickens. Now and then I'd bump into him in the street and ask him how he was. And I remember saying to him once, I don't see much of you. And he said, oh, no, I don't go out. It costs money to go out. It costs money. Because <laughs> I laughed and he said, I know what people call me. I know they call me Scrooge and they call me a miser and all this stuff. And he was laughing. He said, but you mark my words. One of these days, all you lot, you'll all be broke and I'll be rich. <laughs> rich financially, but not rich in happiness. That's what I said to him. Oh, rah, rah, rah. He, he sounded like Scrooge. Rah, 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 rah. Get out of here and all that. He was a great chap, actually. He was a good laugh. It's just that he was this dreadful miser. He passed away and word had it that he'd left something like a million pounds. He lived in this small bungalow. He didn't have a car. He wouldn't spend money. Word had it that he left something like a million pounds. I don't know how true that was. But did he die happy? That's what people were saying in the village. Oh, yeah, million pounds, but did he die happy? I don't know. Money. They used to say money is the root of all evil, didn't they? There's another saying. The lack of money is the root of all evil. Now, there's a thought. The wind is getting up. I can see the old flag going mental out there, going ballistic. It's getting dark. Where are we? Half past two in the afternoon. We've already had some rain. I don't know where these 70 mile an hour winds are along the coast here. Possibly they'll arrive later. I don't know. What I am looking forward to is Saturday night, Sunday morning. The clocks go forward. They spring forward and fall back. They go forward an hour. We will have lighter evenings. We'll still have torrential rain and, and wind and all the rest of it. But at least it'll be daylight for a little bit longer. We have Easter weekend coming up, of course. You'll be listening to this on Easter Sunday, which is nice. Trish is making more hot cross buns. She made a load and gave them away. Mother-in-law had some. My mother had some. People came round for lunch. Several more hot cross buns disappeared. There's none left. So she's, she's now making some more which is rather nice. She's down in the kitchen now and I can smell the cooking. But did you hear about, who was it? I forget which supermarket it was. They're not having the cross on the buns anymore. They're putting a tick. You know, like the Nike tick or the Amazon Prime, is it? Just a tick. I don't think it's connected to any company. But the whole idea of the, the hot cross buns was the cross, the religious thing for Easter. And the idiots have put a tick in its place. Everyone online, they're saying, well, oh, I'm not buying them. I'm not buying any hot cross buns unless they are hot cross buns. I'm not buying hot tick buns, people are saying. Why do they do it? We've got gesture eggs. <laughs> we've got for Christmas, season's greetings, not happy Christmas. And now we've got hot tick buns for Easter. The world's gone balmy. It has. I don't know who these idiots are. It's these idiots behind desks, isn't it? Talked about them before. Idiots sitting behind desks. Well, what shall I do? How can I upset people? Oh, I know. We'll do this. We'll take the cross off the hot cross buns. I'd love to meet some of these idiots and tell them what I think. I'm going to have a break now. Why don't you do the same? I'm going to have a cup of tea and see whether there are any hot cross buns ready to eat. I'm sure there won't be. You never know. I shall go and try my luck. See you in a minute. I wasn't allowed a hot cross bun. Not to worry. Listen to this. Did you know that you've probably quoted Shakespeare thousands of times in your lifetime without even realising it? They were talking about this on the telly the other day. Shakespeare. Are his plays relevant these days, the way he spoke, the way he wrote? Is any of that relevant these days? And someone on the panel, they had a sort of chat panel thing, someone said that we use quotes from Shakespeare every single day and the rest of the panel are looking amused as I was. Here are some of the most popular phrases in common use today. A sorry sight. I've used that. Oh, he was a sorry sight. Apparently that comes from Macbeth. As dead as a doornail. That's an old one that was used when I was a child. I remember that and still in use today. Eaten out of house and home. Henry V part two. Fair play. Now that's something that's used a lot. Oh, fair play to him. I've used that in the past. I'll wear my heart on my sleeve. I didn't know that was Shakespeare. That was a record, wasn't it? Wear my heart on my sleeve. <laughs> I don't know who did that. I'm in a pickle. In stitches. In the twinkling of an eye. Mum's the word. Neither here nor there. Send him packing. Set your teeth on edge. 
There's method in my madness. Too much of a good thing. Vanish into thin air. For goodness sake. Knock, knock. Who's there? That comes from Macbeth. I didn't know that. All's well that ends well, with bated breath. A wild goose chase. I won't go on and on. There are loads of them here. So to answer the question, is Shakespeare relevant today? Well, yes, seemingly so. <laughs> That's interesting, isn't it? At school, we did The Merchant of Venice. I was, what, 13, 14? It was hopeless. Well, when I say we did it, not on the stage in the main assembly hall, just in the classroom, we each had our part. I forget who I was. And we had to read out our lines while we're all sitting at our desks. It was hopeless. People not putting any, you know, me included, not putting any effort into it, just reading blah, 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 blah. No feeling or no, I don't know. No one was interested. To be honest, a bunch of 13, 14 year olds in the 1960s, we didn't want to do that, did we? Looking back, I wish that we had wanted to do that. Our kids weren't interested, I wasn't interested, but I wish that we had been interested now because we, <laughs> we might have learned something rather than all of us going round as thickos now. No, we're not all thickos, but it was a secondary modern school I was in the C stream. We'd failed our 11 plus, so we couldn't go to grammar school. <laughs> Mind you, had we gone to grammar school, my class, I think we would have wasted the brighter kids' time, really. Us lot sitting there reading our comics under the desk. Oh, talking of comics, Ray, thank you for the links you've sent me, the uh, comics, the dandy, the beano. Wonderful. Thank you for that. I've been reading them brought back many memories from the 50s. I used to read The Dandy and The Beano. I think one of them came on a Tuesday morning and one on a Thursday morning. They'd come through the letterbox. My mum would bring the comic in to me. I was still in bed and I'd be reading my comic and she'd be saying, come on, you've got to go to school. Come on, get up, get dressed, get washed. And I was busy reading about Desperate Dan and Lord Snooty. Thank you very much, Ray, for that. That's uh, fantastic. Happy days. Just going back to people who are lucky or unlucky. I knew a chap who his parents were very, very well off. They lived on a private estate, big house. His dad, I don't know what he did, something in the city, you know, all that sort of thing. They had a lot of money. And of course, this friend of mine was born into money. Needless to say, he didn't go to my school. I think he went to a private school somewhere locally. There were, well, there still are some private schools locally. I knew him outside school. That's, uh, that's how we knew each other, outside school. Now, I knew this other chap who was at my school and he was born into poverty, the exact opposite of the other chap. He really was born into poverty. His dad, I don't know where his dad has gone. His mum was struggling to keep the kids going, the house, the bills. And here's the thing. The rich lad and the poor lad were best friends. And they remained best friends after school. I'd bump into one of them now and then and ask how they're getting on. Still best friends. They probably are today because they're probably, what, about my age. They're probably still best friends today. And I remember if anyone came out with derogatory remarks about the rich lad, oh, it's all right for him, all this business, the poverty lad would stick up for him. It was rather strange how the two of them got on so well from completely different ends of the spectrum just goes to show people can get on we're all human beings at the end of the day just because one's got a pocket full of money and the other one's pocket is empty doesn't mean to say they can't be best of friends i like that it's friday we've got the music quiz tonight at our club do you remember last time what was it we got 75 and something 100 pounds 75 pounds on something then the music bingo we got 100 pounds so we'll see how we do tonight. Mind you, the weather is not far to walk, but if it's lashing with rain, I am going to get soaked. All the 70 mile an hour winds and everything that were forecast for last night and yesterday afternoon didn't really happen here. We had a bit of rain, a bit of wind, and that was it. They were talking about structural damage and disaster and rain and torrential. Goodness me, you think the end of the world was nigh. And we had a little bit of rain and a bit of wind. Paul, nice to hear from you from Devon. I like Devon. It's lovely down the West Country. You've asked me how my raspberries are doing. They're doing well. They're coming up nicely. 
green leaves, they're looking good, or despite the cold, the wind, the rain, the dreadful conditions out there, it's awful. It's not gale force wind as predicted, but it's awful all the same. They're doing really well, Paul. Paul asks because he grows raspberries on his small holding and he's given me one or two tips. So thank you for that, Paul. One thing I have to look out for, Paul's mentioned that sparrows eat the leaves and birds will eat the raspberries. My problem, Paul, is mother-in-law. She has said to me, she said the other day when she was here, when those raspberries are ready, I'll be down there picking some of those. She loves raspberries. Trisha doesn't, so I was hoping they're all going to be for me. But now mother-in-law's got her eye on them, so I'm not worried about sparrows and other birds. I'm worried about mother-in-law. Tomorrow night, we're going to see a Pink Floyd tribute band. We saw them in Hastings. We've seen them in Worthing before. Now, my worry is, is this silly? My worry is walking down to the town and back in the dark, especially after we've been there walking home again in the dark. It's going to be half 10, 11 at night. You may think it's silly, but we've just had a, a stabbing in Worthing. Someone was murdered. There, I think there's another stabbing. A shop was robbed. I don't feel safe, to be honest, going out at night anymore. In my teens, of course, I'd walk home from the town centre. I'd walk home, what, two miles at two o'clock in the morning when the club threw out. No problem at all. You'd see some other lads about. There was never any trouble. But now I am really concerned. I've told Trish I'm not sure that I want to go even. So the plan is we will walk there about seven o'clock, I think. And then she said we can get a taxi back. So I think that's the best thing to do. Isn't it a shame, though? I don't feel safe walking out in the dark in my own town. Mind you, it's a damn sight worse in other places. I wouldn't want to walk around London at night, well, even in the day, to be honest. Let's move on to something a little brighter. Oh, daughter number one is coming to the music quiz tonight with us. So hopefully she'll be able to help with some of the, the answers. I don't know any of it. I've said before, I don't know. I don't understand some of the questions, <laughs> let alone the answers. So there'll be six of us in our group. It's now the following day. We came second in the quiz. £30. That's not bad, is it? I think we've still got about £60 in the, in the pot. So we're doing very well. I've just had another daft email. UK weather warning. Britain set for storm hell. Storm hell, struth. As wall of ice over Greenland blocks warm weather. What is a wall of ice? I dread to think. OK, that will do. Happy Easter. Have a good weekend. Let's hope the weather's kind to you. Don't do anything I wouldn't do. And as usual, if you do, don't get caught. <laughs> I shall see you on Wednesday. Take care. Bye-bye for now.